listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hi, everyone. This is Sandra Garcia, and I am a marketing, branding, and business consultant. And what people know me for most in this current life is working with Google as a digital coach, but also being a small business owner that works with small businesses to help increase revenue as well as corporate partners. And what I'm most excited about right now is the opportunity to work with larger organizations on a diversity, equity, and inclusion capacity to help create opportunities for more people that look like me. Sandra Garcia, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to respond to that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I certainly don't respond if you're not happy to be on, but (laughs) but I think you are. We probably wouldn't have gotten to this point, so... (laughs) but thank you so much i'm so excited for this conversation uh so thank you for having me anytime and i want to give this audience a little bit of more background on you so i'm going to read a little bit from your bio uh of course this is from the internet and we know the internet is not always a truth teller so you can feel free to correct me if anything is incorrect but um i'll start uh Often you can just uh, tell me at the end if it sounds about right uh, or stop me if it doesn't sound right. Sandra's corporate experience includes the following organizations, Clear Channel Outdoor, Tom Warner Cable Media, People.com, and CNNMoney.com. Now, as the founder of Encounter Your Potential, Sandra enjoys developing and executing strategies that use marketing as the pillar for achieving business goals and drive revenue goals. As a full-time entrepreneur, her growing list of businesses served include Google, J.P. Morgan Chase, HSBC Bank Toronto, Vivo, the Howard University School of Divinity, and Capo Consulting. Sandra is the current NY Chapter President of NAMIC, which is the National Association of Multi-Ethnicity and Communications, sits on the Board of Influencers for Digital Diversity Network, or DDN, and the Young Leaders Board for America Needs You. Sandra was a Forbes 30 Under 30 2016 finalist, and in 2012 was awarded by Latino Leaders Magazine, a top 25 future Latino leader. And I want to start off, Sandra, by asking you, you have a quote, and it is, trouble is a bubble in a champagne glass. (laughs) What does that mean to you? Oh, man, the internet. (laughs) So... Trouble is a bubble in a champagne glass. I'm definitely a sparkling wine lover, and we can go with champagne. And um, it is my drink of choice. So that's literally what that means. And if I am going out, um, that is what I will be having. And fun fact, um, normal times, uh, right now would be gala season in New York and several other places. So that was my way of looking classy by drinking a glass of champagne, but trouble by adding a shot of vodka. So I don't know if this is what I should be saying on uh, (laughs) the show right now, but fun fact, I am human. um, And it just helps to create conversation starters and uh, to add a dynamic layer to the networking. Um, so yeah, that's literally what trouble in a bubble in a champagne glass is in addition to, uh, me stealing that from Usher's, uh, lyrics. You, uh, are perfectly fine saying this. We love humans on the make it podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So, so feel free to be human here. You're an avid athlete and a marathon runner, sprinter, uh, in college, Mm -hmm. uh, long distance runner in high school. What is your morning routine? Yes. 
Well, that depends on the seasons. Um, what I do want to go back and just clarify, um, I could tell you had an older version of the bio because I am no longer the near chapter president for NAMIC. I'm the immediate past president. So mm-hmm. I served a two-year term. And after my two-year term as president, for the New York chapter, I now sit on the National Board of Directors. And uh, what I do on now the National Board is advise uh, our 18 chapters in terms of programming and membership support to the larger organization. And then also no longer on the Board of Influencers for DDN. I sat on the board for about a year and now I'll be moving um, forward with the organization in a consulting capacity. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for that correction, by the way, and internet strikes again, but, (laughs) but, but you're someone who um, really believes in the freedom of movement that entrepreneurialism has provided you. And so, so many of our uh, audience are creatives that are living day to day, creating their own schedule. I'm curious what your morning routine is. Yeah, thank you for taking me back there. There is no real morning routine. So in the summer, because I'm a warm weather child, I love... I, well, I naturally wake up earlier and I also like to get started with a run. So I'm um, just getting it out the way because something about longer days, especially in New York City, uh, makes me feel like I have to get out there. Now, in the winter, that is a lot harder because it's chilly. So I want to stay in bed. Um, <laughs> I'm... I am definitely a believer in affirmations. So I affirm myself to get up. That's kind of like my secret moment with me um, before I tackle the day. And I know that some people go towards or leverage meditation in order to um, get into the mindset to tackle the day. And for me, it's really affirming myself and uh, just saying, it's going to be a great day. We're going to take care of this. We got this. So just like I would back in the day when I was preparing myself for a race as a track and field athlete. um, Yeah. I hype myself up to get the day going. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Any, um, any recommendations on breakfast? breakfast. Um, not, not recommendations at all, but what I tend to go to is Greek yogurt, light and fit Greek yogurt and <laughs> calories. And I love to mix it up with uh, one of those snack pack of almonds or mixed nuts. That's like my go-to. And then I am a coffee drinker. So I, for some reason now I require a cup of coffee to also get the day going. So my Greek yogurt and coffee. I've been quoted as saying life is too short for bad coffee. Mm. And I am a coffee, coffee stops. And not only do I require the cup, but I demand it. Uh, Mm. (laughs) You have, you have been such an inspiration, not only to women, but uh, to women of color, uh, all across this country and, and and every life you've touched and supported and, and tried to help uh, through um, your own story, your own mission, your own brand, but also through y- your marketing and branding work. And as such, you have all these titles. So you have brand consulting, you do in all these levels of expertise, right? Like you have leadership development, you can do email marketing, project management, marketing consulting, business consulting, event planning, marketing strategy, brand strategy, social media marketing, and I'm sure I could name marketing, mm-hmm. and I'm sure I could name 10 more. So, you know, my question to you is, is one that's sort of tried and true in, in the creative field and film. Uh, is it better to be a multi-hyphenate mm-hmm. or to be known as just one thing? What are the upsides and downsides in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I definitely consider myself a multi-hyphenate. You said it's okay to be human. And as humans, we're multi-layered. We're intersectional. There, There are multiple things that we're good at. And that was actually... 
um, what led to me leaving corporate America. Because in corporate America, um, I sat within a marketing solutions department. And although I was touching different parts of marketing, I was to focus on just that. But I realized, you know what? I actually have several different loves. I'm passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love the business world. And I think as a strategist, I think ahead. And I also love creative marketing, but I can also strategically market. And I don't want to limit myself as to what I um, can do and will do. And it took me a while to figure it out. And it took me trying to find that job that was a perfect fit for me to realize that I wasn't going to find that. So I had to create a space for it. So for me and my personality type, and um, I guess where I am in life as well, it works for me to be a multi-hyphenate. Uh, I call it diversifying my portfolio. And especially during times like now when uh, you know COVID hit, and you had to just expect the unexpected. You didn't really know what was going to happen from today to tomorrow. It has worked for me because I have different layers of business. And when maybe the marketing aspects of the business isn't moving as aggressively as I may want for it to, the diversity, equity, and inclusion has been booming. And that has led to me having the most successful year so far as a business owner, even during a pandemic. Yeah, that's been fascinating to uh, to experience for Nick and I as well, because even though the pandemic's happening, access to us got easier because mm-hmm. before we would have to fly to you to speak to you or meet you where you're at or meet halfway or we'd have to go outside. Now uh, um, there'd be a cost associated with that, but now you can meet us online. And it's, it's faster. Now I don't want to replace it because I think there's power to be, to being in person, but Mm -hmm. it is interesting how there's been certain things that have stuck out about this year and the way we all pivot, uh, did a pivot to, to sort of survive the year that's been powerful and things that we won't Mm -hmm. let go of in the future, even after hopefully the pandemic is over. Uh, and, and I love your answer to that because it really sort of aligns with one of my favorite quotes of yours, which is there is no passion to be found playing small, yeah. uh, in settling for a life that is less than one than the one you're capable of living. Mm-hmm. So it definitely comes out in, in that answer. Um, you eat your own dog food as well. Uh, for many years, you were sort of someone who, is working in in these businesses, in these large corporations. And now if you go online, you're definitely out in front of the camera. So can you speak to the transition from having a private persona to a more public one? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. First of all, um, I'm, you did such a great job finding these quotes. Um, thank you. Um, so I, it, it, just like I would say I'm, I'm a multi-hyphenate, I also say that I'm really an introvert, but I'm a working extrovert. And people are always shocked when I say that I'm really an introvert. But um, I realized that I had to own my brand and my personal brand in order to drive the business. And it took time for that to happen because I'm actually really shy. But at this point, I have trained and I have worked myself to be able to turn it on. But then that also exhausts me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, I, it's a it's a business necessity uh, because I am the CEO and the CMO of the business and then also of my personal brand. So I have to be able to drive it. And also the pressures are so the pressures are different and the pressures are different when you have to create and make something out of nothing. And then also have a team that's relying and depending on you. And, um, I also just saw the power of being able to show up and to show up authentically. My biggest opportunities have come from the most unexpected places and have sometimes come from me showing up and agreeing to do things uh, that 
definitely put me outside of my comfort zone. Uh, the opportunity that I have right now to work with Google, I showed up, I did a speaking engagement uh, in front of a room of 300 people. It was the first time I had spoken in front of a room on a stage that high with so many lights on me. Uh, and it was nerve wracking. And I, you know, had to talk myself up to prepare for that presentation. And months, months later, uh, it turned into something beautiful that has then also helped me grow my own business. And it was really just me stepping outside of my comfort zone and putting myself out there even before I was ready in order to now be prepared for opportunities as they come my way. Yeah. And I think there's so many uh, creatives in film that can identify with that, especially this part about being an introvert. And now due to sort of the conditions of distributing film and the conditions of, of the social media world, they have to now turn themselves on a dime into extroverts or in their mind extroverts and say, well, you know, a lot of them just give up and they say, well, I can't, you know, I can't do that. I can't be that person. So what do I do now? And so it's, it's very inspiring to hear that, Hey, you can do it. You can train yourself to be an ext- extrovert. And one of the reasons I was so excited to have you uh, on the podcast to have this conversation is because something that Nick and I constantly preach on our indie talks uh, that happen biweekly is that branding and marketing is so critical for the success of a film project. And in our belief, just basically any project. And it's the thing that's missing from the budget uh, and, and, and sort of the below the line budget, um, on, on so many film, um, projects. And so having you on to sort of speak to that world, I think is going to be really valuable because it's a different messenger and it's someone that's worked in different, you're someone that's worked in so many different fields. So, uh, with that, I, I, I thought I'd take it down to some of the the tactical here Mm -hmm. and and, and get into the uh, didactic, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a lot of people that think branding and marketing are the same. Mm -hmm. How would you define each and and which is the higher priority in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's definitely get into the tactical. Um, So branding and marketing are not the same. They're in the same family. I would say branding occurs uh, before marketing. Uh, Branding is creating your identity or the identity of a product or a business. And branding can consist of things like um, one, your name or a project name, business name, just starting there. So it's the, it's the fundamentals. It is the basics. Uh, it is the name, it is the logo, it is your colors, your mood board, it is your brand tone. It is that feeling you want for people to get from your brand and even your brand colors. I have a grid, uh, that I call the psychology of color because different colors inspire different emotions. And this is all branding, uh, the foundation and the structure, Marketing is now connecting with your audience and getting the business out there, driving awareness, uh, driving consideration. It is now putting this product that exists and that has brand uh, that is now has brand identity out in front of people in order to get support. So branding is a foundation and marketing is the way that you uh, get it out there. I love that. Thank you so much. And you mentioned sort of having to train yourself Mm -hmm. to be this extrovert so that you can manage your own brand. What advice would you give someone and what would you consider maybe uh, instead of advice, let's say, what would you consider is the first step in branding and marketing your own skills and assets Mm -hmm. so that you can sell a product, let's say? or sell a film or sell Mm -hmm. something creative? Yeah, that's a powerful question, actually. And the first thing I would say is to own it. Uh, whether you are intentional about your personal brand or whether you uh, ever thought of yourself as a brand, we are all brands. And I like to share with as many people as I can that 
the first name brand that we ever represent before attachments, um, before companies with we attach ourselves to, before businesses that we build, before partners and friends and family. It, it, well, family, we need them to get here. But it's our own personal brand. It's our own name. Your first and last name, that is the first name brand that you ever represent. So it is important to own it and to be aware of it and to be intentional about how you showcase your brand especially if you are a creative genius and your creative genius is dependent on you showing up and presenting. So I think that's first being uh, intentional and aware of how you want to be presented and being intentional and aware then is now creating clarity for what do you want your brand to represent? If you are a creative, what kind of creative and what is it that you want for people to think of you as and know of you as. So if someone were to say to me, oh yeah, do you know that guy, Christopher um, Barkley from the, um, you know, he has the podcast and, you know, that aha moment uh, when people respond and say, oh yeah, I know Chris, um, you know, I know him from Tennessee or I know him from DC. I met him at that event in LA. That's your personal brand working. And when we are in creative spaces, our brand perception and that image that we create in people's minds sometimes leads uh, and, and influences decisions that are made about us and opportunities that come our way when we're not even in the room. Yeah, I think that's really brilliant. You know, something I used to tell my kids when they were much younger uh, and if they had had a bad day at school or misbehaved or something like that, I would always pull them to the side and say, hey, guys, we all have the same last name. <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. yeah. And that was well before um, I got started with Nick and Bonza. So even it, even in that sort of natural organic sense, I think we all have an understanding that brand and personal brand is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the differences of importance between a branding strategy and execution, because oftentimes we'll separate those two as two different types of things. But I think a lot of times um, the client um, or the creator looks at them as the same. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of those differences between a branding strategy and an execution. Mm -hmm. So I say the strategy is the plan and execution is how you're going to do it. So for example, right now we are in November, we are approaching the end of 2020. Boy, has 2020 been a challenging year. <laughs> Uh, if you enter 2020, oh, okay, so here's another way that I like to position it as well, because at the beginning of each year, people love to um, host vision board parties and create vision boards, especially women. We love it. Now, if you had a vision for yourself or created a roadmap of what you thought 2020 was going to be like, and we got to March and we realized actually it's, it's not going to work out that way with the strategy and with an execution plan, you could have took a look at all the things that you have and figured out what can you move around to work with what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I recommend for businesses. Um, without a plan and without a plan, so without a strategy and just a vision board, for example, is hard to move images around. Um, so I recommend that people strategize with a roadmap and a roadmap can be 12 months of the year laid out mm -hmm. for every month of the year, um, then outline four different weeks. And then for each week um, within a month, lay out what are things you're going to accomplish. Create a strategy that consists of a plan. Go from long view to, to granular. So 12 months, you can either break it down into quarters. So four quarters and then three, um, three months in a quarter, and then break it down by four months in um, four weeks in a month. What are you going to do each week in order to impact what 
uh, what can take place within that month, what can take place within that quarter, and then ultimately what you can accomplish in a year. And that is a strategy. Execution, if you are creative, can be things like uh, marketing channels. So I'm going to leverage email marketing in order to connect with this audience. I am going to leverage social media marketing in order to create with this audience. Um, I am going to leverage video marketing in order to do this. So now those are your marketing channel tactics in order to execute on that plan with different goals that you created. So that's where also we begin to differentiate between, uh, you know, strategic and then also also execution. Is growth hacking dead? No, I don't think so. And they're different. One, I would have to say it's it's totally not my area of expertise, growth hacking and uh, growth marketing. I actually outsource that part. Um, when people do come to me for growth marketing, um, I... I think there are always forms and ways of growth hacking, and, and I'm going to speak actually more to growth marketing since that is what I would be most close and familiar with. Um, growth marketing to me is advertisement. And how can you increase awareness using advertisement? Now, for me, although I do have a background, a corporate background in advertising, I'm a big believer in organic growth. And um, having your brand grow based on its own power, at least in the very beginning, before you begin to invest. And I myself am not in a position yet where I have had to invest uh, in growth marketing. I have not had to do any kind of advertising. It's all been um, organic leads. Um, what I recommend that entrepreneurs, solopreneurs do is to exhaust all possible free options um, when it comes to growth marketing. And one of the most powerful tools that you can use is the power of relationships, power of relationships, and then also word of mouth. So word of mouth goes with, you know, how, what is your brand representation and what is people's experience with you and what are they going to say about you? And can they advocate for you in a room of opportunities where you are not? I love that. I love that. Everyone has a brand today. <laughs> I mean, Instagram is just overwrought. I mean, it's it's just overflowing. The, the bucket is full, it feels like. And I'm curious, in your opinion, does that make everyone a client or a competitor? Mm. Um, good, good question. These are really good questions. Um, I would not say a competitor. What I actually would say instead is that every touch point and in every opportunity is an opportunity to prove value. And this is part of how and what your outlook is, right? So I say that every opportunity is also an interview. We are constantly interviewing. So we cannot approach as in constant competition because that's exhausting. But how are you constantly interviewing for your next opportunity? And someone who is doing like and similar work could be an opportunity. So how do you um, extend and leverage even what people who are doing like things? How do you use that to potentially grow? And what I do and what I've done um, during this COVID state of life is partner with other agencies mm. um, because I don't want to compete and I am a small shop and there are opportunities that may come my way, but depending on capacity, I may not have the bandwidth for it. Right. But I will grow more if I'm able to play nice and offer and extend these opportunities to like and similar businesses and business owners and uh, cultivate and create a partnership so that then one, we can either revenue share so that I don't have to miss out on the opportunity. So now I'm playing nice in the sand because I may not be able to take this on, but you may have been with for it. So let's win together. And then we can continue to feed each other in that way. So I don't say compete, but I say find the opportunity within the opportunity and then also use every touch point to create and add value. In the current zeitgeist, there seems to be an unrelenting attack on Facebook and particularly the way their ad business works. And 
social media advertising and marketing and branding is such a central part of sort of any company's uh, success, it seems like. So I'm curious, what, what, what is the future of social media marketing, in your opinion? Do you mm-hmm. think these uh, tags are justified as well? Yeah. Um, who social is ever evolving. Who knew that it would become what it is today? I was in college. I don't know how, um, whether I'm going to tell my age or expose my age right now, <laughs> but <laughs> I was in college, uh, when, uh, Facebook came out. Um, and I remember how it started and to see how it's evolved and now to also even look at my own consumer habits. Um, I think it's here. Uh, we crave some kind of social engagement and there's also an addictive quality to social, um, which we humans feed. Um, but then also these social platforms are created in a way where they kind of drive and inspire addictive behavior. Um, an addictive behavior because we, we get a high off of likes, we get a high off of views, we get a high off of seeing that we're capturing people's attention and we crave that attention, human nature. Um, and, and that is part of what drives it. Um, and that is how advertising works. Advertising is based on viewership and it's based on impressions. Um, I think social is here social in the past used to be, used to happen in a different form. I always say that the most powerful form of marketing that will never go away, no matter whether TikTok is here, taking away Vimeo, Snapchat, no matter what new platform comes around is word of mouth marketing, because it also happens in the digital virtual space as well. Um, uh, if we leave reviews after we visit a restaurant, or even if we see someone was there and we leave a comment, like that's word of mouth marketing right there, uh, which is why influencer marketing has been leveraged so much. So I think it's here. I think it's going to evolve how we as people socially engage continues to evolve. And with that social media marketing is going to take on new forms. And right now that form is, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and LinkedIn, um, which I think it's a great social platform that goes underutilized by um, business owners and creatives. Um, but it's it's here. Yeah, and Nick and I have always said the holy grail of marketing is word of mouth. It's really the number one way to move someone's uh, attention and move someone's opinion on a thing. Um, and it, it it can bite filmmakers in the butt sometimes. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's something that I've sort of gently, uh, criticized some of the creators in the space for is that when they're, when their friends are doing a project, um, it, you know, you need to go on IMDb and you need to, to rate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, be fair, but you can, you can put a little icing on it because no one else is going to help an independent filmmaker, right? It's not a Hollywood film that's going to be driven by millions of dollars of marketing behind it. Right. So if you thought the movie was a six, go ahead and give it an eight, right? There's nothing wrong Mm -hmm. with that because it's a really small window that these films are operating in. Instead, what happens, Sandra, is that they go in and rate it a three, Mm. or a one. And it's like, these are the people that are in your field trying to uh, make this a better place where everybody can make more stuff, get paid more. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a shame. And then I think the other thing is, is we have to also support each other, right? Mm -hmm. You know, everyone on social media says, uh, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. But but then you look at the receipts and like <laughs> they didn't go out and buy the stuff. <laughs> they didn't go out and watch the stuff. So I, I think that's, that's so critical. So I appreciate you, you saying that uh, it, sort of in that same vein, there's a lot of different avenues and places to go. Um, and I find it fascinating to try to do the math around it because you can place ads on Facebook and you can uh, through Facebook, you're placing ads on Instagram. You can place ads on Pinterest. You can place ads on LinkedIn. You can place ads on Snapchat and and TikTok. So I'm just wondering from your experience, what do you think is the best value per dollar in social Mm -hmm. marketing? Yeah, Um, that is another great question. And uh, I would say that's not my sweet spot. But what I would say 
is that knowing your audience and looking at data will help you make informed data-driven decisions about your business. And also there is no right um, there is no perfect recipe. I call it the recipe, right? So depending on who you are, depending on what your business is, you might require a little bit more salt, a little bit more pepper, depending on the season you might, your recipe mix may require something different. Um, 2020 is a perfect example of that. Um, if you were doing some form of uh, maybe guerrilla marketing, in-person marketing, event marketing, you had to change your recipe mix and do a little bit more digital marketing. So everyone's business and everyone's exact recipe mix will be different. But to get to that one, it requires knowing your audience, knowing where they're spending time. So you can also figure out where to engage them and then also experimenting and seeing what works, what doesn't work, experimenting with seasonality. If you live in a place like New York, like I do, we go through different seasons. And um, so since we are speaking to an audience of creatives, for example, um, you know, in the summertime, um, people are a lot more active. And I saw how businesses shifted their business model in order to be able to engage. There was a lot of outdoor, there was a lot more outdoor entertainment. Um, usually in the winter, um, we would, um, we would consume a lot more indoor entertainment that has now changed because of COVID. So I think people will be going online. The demand for entertainment is still there. It's just how people will consume. So Broadway, for example, we can't go to a Broadway show, but people who loved Broadway a year ago, don't all of a sudden not love Broadway. They may still want to support and how they support will be different. Um, so I really think that is important to know your audience um, and try to place yourself in the environments in which your audience is naturally uh, consuming and engaging. And then also be mindful of things like um, seasonality, time of day, um, also really just knowing your audience and what could be happening within their lives as well. Yeah, I love that that answer. And the more specific your audience is, uh, in our opinion, the easier that process, you know, really is. The uh, you are, I should say, someone who just by living your life and being the entrepreneur and 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 sort of superwoman that you are, I think inspire a lot of people that you're around. And whenever I see someone who's truly inspiring, I always think, well, someone inspired them first. So mm -hmm. looking at that and from, and from that lens, what, what are the two best pieces of advice you've received so far in your career and, mm -hmm. and who did they come from? Yeah. So I, I say that I collect pieces of people that I admire. Um, and I've started, I, I realized I was doing this, um, as a little girl, but really we all do that as we're, um, as we're socially engaging, uh, and socializing and collecting information as you're creating your lens of the world. So, um, anyone who knows me knows I love Oprah. Um, I love my parents, but if Oprah can adopt me, I will, you know, even at my age, <laughs> be more open to the idea. She's brilliant. Um, from Nashville, by the way, what was that from Nashville, by the way? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Um, but I, I, I love what she's been able to do. And I love that, um, we see where she is now, but a lot of people don't know that her career didn't even begin to take off until she was 34. Um, and especially for my generation of instant gratification and we want to be instant successes and we get impatient when it's not happening fast enough. Um, things like that give me hope because um, I'm, and Oprah says this as well, that we're all in the pursuit of um 
pursuit of the highest expression and vision of ourselves. And that's really true. And that changes over time. Um, and although, uh, five years ago, I would have never imagined that I would be here. Um, who knows where I'll be in five years, but I'm still in the pursuit of whatever that highest vision and expression of myself may be based on what comes at that time. Um, but I really do love collecting pieces and parts of people that I admire. I admire parts about Michelle Obama. Um, I admire things about everyday people, how they walk into a room and how confident they may be, how graceful they may be. So I think I'm constantly just collecting um, pieces of different people in the pursuit of the highest expression of my own self. I love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, if you could provide, you know, with respect to, you know, how you would brand yourself or brand a product, if you could provide filmmakers that listen to this podcast Mm -hmm. with one piece of advice, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of branding, um, a product, I would say lead one with your brand, lead with your story, um, bring it to life, personalize. We started um, this session today with you allowing me space and grace um, to be human. And I think that's okay. And I think to personalize, it's okay. And to create personal connections because people love to support other people. Uh, whether they love a film, a product, um, a service that you offer the industry, I would say be super intentional about your personal brand and, and aware of how your personal brand impacts, feeds, and influences the things that we also birth and put into the universe. Um, second to that, I would say don't rush to process, um, take care and be tight about creating a solid foundation. Do not skip parts of branding to get to marketing. Um, I, see that especially creative people love to rush to the part that's visible. Um, but the lonely, unsexy private work that needs to be done, uh, the late nights, um, you know, that, that is necessary in order to really be able to produce and put amazing products in front of people that doesn't just look good, but that is good. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing because I, uh, uh, that's amazing advice because I look at um, what I consider one of the most brilliant and impactful and powerful marketing pieces in entertainment in the last decade uh, was probably nothing more than text written in Tumblr by Frank Ocean. Mm-hmm. You know, Frank Ocean was, it's always been a brilliant poet and street poet, if you want to call it that, but and performer and singer but he was sort of this middling guy in this big group called odd future. So, you know, how do you separate yourself from that? And he wrote this very honest letter about falling in love with a guy, uh, when every, when the world thought he was straight and he became a, he became a superstar off a letter. So it wasn't anything visual like you were mentioning. It wasn't a video. He didn't put out a dance. He didn't release a song. He wrote a letter on Tumblr to his fans Mm -hmm. and it went absolutely viral. And I think it launched his career and put him into a new place and it actually streamlined his audience for him. So I I always think about the power of that authenticity Mm -hmm. uh, when you go out and do that. Um, you, you, You talked about being human on this podcast. And so I see that there's a lot of people out there that want to be Sandra Garcia. (laughs) there's There's a lot of people who, you know, want to start this kind of business or, um, say they have this kind of business and maybe they don't, they, they're not really doing it or don't have any clients or, um, maybe they're fumbling their way through. So from your, uh, experience, what are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see those folks making Mm -hmm. or new newcomers to your business? Yeah. Um, I, I really think it's about one finding your why, um, 
I say that, um, and I say this to my girlfriend sometimes, that people love to see the highlight reel um, and people love to see the end result, um, but people are still uninterested to uh, hear when I'm like, I'm tired. I mean, I've slept, you know, four hours in the last, like it's unhealthy. Yes. I haven't worked out as much as I want to. These are the things that are, you know, don't get as much attention. And those are the things that sometimes people don't even care to hear about. Um, but those are the things that lead to sometimes the highlight reel and the results that people love and enjoy to see, but there's a lot of back work. Um, I would say it's important to understand your why, um, why you're doing certain things, because there are a lot of moments um, where you can even question <laughs> why you're doing it. <laughs> um, and um, the pressure is high. And depending on how much you want to grow, um, with more growth, with the bigger the brands um, and the clientele that I bring in, the more the pressure. Um, and to provide good customer service and good value and to set the foundation to continue to receive more work, it does require some kind of work ethic and quality um, and expertise as well. So... I say take the time to learn yourself, take the time to learn how you can also best service people in your own unique way. Um, you may not be offering something that is completely new, but it's you, so it's unique to you. And most people will choose to work with you. It's not always what it is that you're offering because there are millions of agencies out there. Um, and there's enough for everyone. Um, but definitely your why. Another great piece of advice that I got early on in my journey to full-time entrepreneurship was to be adaptable because what you think your original idea will be that will help sustain you may not be it. And the marketplace is usually what drives um, the demand for your business. And this year, for example, was a year where the demands for me and my business came from something that I realized later on I was good at, not what I originally intended to do when I launched the organization and, and the agency. So to be adaptable, um, listen to the marketplace um, and be willing to put in the, you know, the late night lonely work um, so that you can show up the next day prepared. What really stuck, stuck out for me there, oh, all of it was great. So thank you for that. But, but one line stuck out for me, which is there's enough for everybody. And there's a lot of sentiment and I think cynicism, honestly, about um, the way business works in America and that it's a total zero sum game. Mm -hmm. And I completely disagree with that. And maybe mm -hmm. um, people will call me uh, a foolish optimist, but I think, I think work is positive. Some, I think me and you can exist in the same world and people will work with me for one reason and work with you for another reason. I don't think they work with me over you mm -hmm. or you over me. Therefore I starve and, and you eat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was a, a wonderful thing to say. I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this next question oh, man. <laughs> because you were, you were, you were born in Honduras, but you moved to New York when you were five and you've been there since then, except for your stints in college in, in Pennsylvania and in DC and around. But, um, if you had one month to teach someone how to thrive and survive or mm -hmm. survive and thrive in New York city, what would be the first three things you teach them? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Where do I begin? Um, how to survive and thrive in New York city. Whew. Um, wow. I would say, um, New York is definitely a place um, where relationships have been key and the power of relationships have been um, such a big influence in helping me move the needle. Uh, so I would say uh, you're street savvy, you're people savvy. Um, 
and being able to cultivate and navigate relationships, which means it's a two way street. I don't believe in networking. Um, I believe in relationship building and approaching everything with a strategy. New Yorkers think fast. We talk fast. We're impatient. Um, so being able to master that as well, getting your thoughts, ideas out there quick and you're constantly selling yourself. That was another piece of advice that I got really early in my career that, um, you, the first thing and the thing you're constantly selling and representing the first product is always yourself. And then from there, people will listen to what you have to say. So show up, um, prepared to be able to pitch <laughs> mm-hmm. at all points in time, but also quickly and, uh, concisely, uh, and efficiently, uh, and being able to identify key players and be able to find a way to also reciprocate and to feed the relationship without always just taking. Mm, I love that. I have a close friend that got a job in New York city and uh, he called me one night and he said, this place has 10 million people in it and it's the loneliest place in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he had, uh, he had a tough time of it. And I have other friends that have lived there their whole life and love it and would, would never leave. And so that's, that was kind of the spirit behind that question is just to say, um, it, it takes, a, it takes uh, some special learning and, and sort of a certain temperament, but I think you can make it happen. It's a, it's a great place every time I've been for sure. Yeah. Uh, Sandra, you've been such a great sport. You've been such a wealth of knowledge. This has been a, a blast for me and, and I hope for this audience. Can, can you tell everybody where they can find you on the internet and on social media? Yes, on the internets. Um, so one, thank you so much. Thank you for um, creating space and thank you for the time. Uh, any opportunity to be able to share a little bit more about myself and my journey, I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, online, my two social platforms are Instagram and LinkedIn. And I am Sandy underscore Garlo on Instagram and on LinkedIn, Sandra Elisa Garcia, and the way that I brand myself, all my uh, social um, profiles are, I am wearing red. (laughs) (laughs) So you cannot miss the girl with the red dress, red suit, and blonde hair. I love that. And is there a place where we can find you on a website or on the internet? Yes. Mm -hmm. So my personal brand site is SandraElisaGarcia.com, my first, middle, and last name, uh, .com. And then my business is EncounterYourPotential.com. Perfect. And we'll wrap on this. Uh, Your dad worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Mm -hmm. in New York City most of your life growing up. And you talk about him a lot as an inspiration uh, because of what he did with his free time and building properties and developing developing them in Honduras, uh, Mm -hmm. where you're from and where he's from. I'm just curious, would you would you consider yourself a daddy's girl? And, and, And if so, why do you think you gravitated towards that? Oh, Chris, you did such good research. Um, uh, This is one of the best interviews I've had because you've uncovered so much. Um, Absolutely. I I say I have an older brother, but I say I'm the son my father never had. (laughs) I'm sure he loves that. I'm sure your brother loves that. Yes, he tells me I'm his favorite. And if any of my sisters are listening to this, they probably would say he says the same. But um, I'm very much a lot of parts of my father, but I think I'm a good man mix of my, both my parents. So, um, he was definitely entrepreneurial minded and still is. And I didn't realize what he was doing for a long, for, um, much of my life. But I realized that, um, I got that from him, um, just being a restless spirit because of him. Um, and then also, uh, he values legacy. And one thing you mentioned earlier is, um, what you would say to your son that we all have the last name. So my father is very Garcia proud, uh, how we present, how we show up and what people see view and how they experience us as a family, uh, was something that was reinforced growing up. So, um, very proud. Um, and then also that's personal 
branding. And that was personal branding before I realized what it was. Um, but what do you mean to your community, starting with your family and then the extensions of your family and then whatever space that you also uh, take up from work um, to other extensions of ourselves? So I don't know if it would be a daddy's girl in the traditional sense, but very much influenced uh, by his values and cultural values. Well, I think he did a great job. I think your mom did too. And uh, your siblings uh, probably helped you along as well. So, and and you did a great job in this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I, I wish you the the best of luck and uh, a great rest of the year going into the holiday season. Uh, Sandra, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Ditto. And I hope we get to talk again soon. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye -bye. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on book us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain until next time. Be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.